My name is Ashish Joshi. I'm an attorney in Michigan. I'm based out of Ann Arbor. And my practice focuses on litigating cases involving parental alienation. I litigate these cases uh, across the country in the United States and also am part of the legal teams internationally in dealing with these cases. Parental alienation is a pretty severe issue facing family courts all around the world. This is not just an American issue. When we look at the family courts and the judicial opinions coming out from all corners of the world, we see parental alienation as a primary focus as days and the issue of child alignment comes across time and again. Today, we are gonna talk about what does the legal landscape look when we talk about parental alienation? How do you prove a case of alienation in court? What are the basic issues that you should be aware of when you're walking into a family court in America or elsewhere? And what are some of the pitfalls and controversies that surround this theme of parental alienation? As we talk about the issues, we'll also talk about some practice pointers that help you present your case better in the court and helps you work with your lawyers, uh, your experts when you go into the court trying to convince the judge to give you the relief that you desperately need to protect your children, your grandchildren, and the relationships you have with them. I'm going to use a PowerPoint uh, as we go on, and there'll be slides that give you information. At the end of the PowerPoint, I have some references that will help you in terms of books, scientific literature, legal literature, and uh, some of the controversies that we talk about will also be reflected on the slides. So let's start with the team. And let's start, I will pull up my PowerPoint to talk about it. So first, let's talk about the term parental alienation. And what's in the name? This term is so controversial that there's a tremendous amount of misinformation, disinformation, and propaganda surrounding the term parental alienation. When you break down the cases of family courts, we see that the courts have used different terminology to reflect, to talk about the behaviors that surround the term parental alienation. We see the courts using the term brainwashing. We see them use the term gatekeeping. Uh, of course, parental alienation term is also used by courts numerous, on numerous occasions. We see the courts using the term parental interference, pathogenic pr parenting, programming, and all sorts of things. But at the end of the day, the courts are talking about a specific set of behaviors that are manifested by parents and a specific signs of alienation that are found in the children. And together, the two constitute parental alienation. So it could be possible that in your jurisdiction, the courts may not have used the term parental alienation as such, but could be using terms such as uh, uh, counterparenting or gatekeeping and, has, and have frowned upon the very behaviors that a parent has manifested, which are the heart of parental alienation. So what do you do when you are in court? trying to present the case of alienation. There are three things to remember here. Number one, you need to convince your judge, your trier of fact, that parental alienation is real, that we are talking about a real phenomenon. We are talking about something that is concrete, that has been studied by scientific uh, literature, that's been published in science uh, and professional literature. There are empirical studies supporting the theory of parental alienation, and it's a real thing. We are not talking about some esoteric theory or speculating about something that may or may not exist. It's a very real dynamic that needs to be addressed. That's the first challenge and the first goal. The second goal you have to convince a judge is that parental alienation is occurring in this case in your case. 
This is not just about some theories and scientific literature. This is a real problem that you have in your case with your children. And third goal is that the children need proper and timely intervention. Together, these three goals lead you to the relief that you desperately need in cases of alienation. So let's talk about the first one. Parental alienation is real. This is a new book that I just wrote that was published by the American Bar Association. Uh, came out just a couple of months ago. And in this book, I talk about how to prepare a case to present in the court, how to lay your evidence out, how to pick the experts, how to work with the expert witnesses, how to convince your judge. I also give you charts and case law from the courts around the country. There's also a chapter on international issues in parental alienation. Because the number one controversy or the number one uh, excuse that comes across sometimes is that it just doesn't exist, that so-and-so judge or so-and-so court doesn't believe in parental alienation. And that's false, because when we study these cases around the country, we know that the phenomenon of alienation is not only real, but has been accepted and acknowledged by the courts around the country and internationally. For example, the foreword in my book was written by the Chief Justice of Michigan Supreme Court, Justice Bridget McCormick. And she describes how parental alienation is a complex and serious issue that confronts the judges in family courts around the country. She talks about how timely intervention is key and proper intervention is needed to protect the children. And this is not just Michigan uh, judges talking about it. Justice McCormick echoes the concerns that have been put forward by family court judges around the country and internationally. Another good resource to keep in mind when you're trying to convince the court that it's a real phenomenon is the book that came out last year, Parental Alienation, Science and Law. And there are chapters written in this book by experts from around the country and internationally, which talk about the empirical studies that underlie the theory of alienation. What are these studies? How they were made? Why can you trust these studies and how to use them in court? People often talk about how this is not a real thing. And there is often a propaganda of misinformation that courts don't believe in alienation, or it's just a bogus theory. Well, this is a great uh, study done by Dr. Lorandos, and it's a part of the book 2020, uh, Parental Alienation Science and Law. And in this particular chapter, he talks about his evaluation and his study of the court decisions in the US. At the trial and appellate level from 1985 to 2018, and it talks about how when you look at the gamut of these cases, the entire database, it makes clear, it makes it absolutely clear that the courts have not only acknowledged alienation and have found this theory to be sound, but have intervened and have changed custody, have provided necessary intervention, have provided sanctions when necessary, to hold the parent accountable and required proper intervention and review hearings to make sure that children get the relief that they desperately need. So when you are in court, how do you go around trying to convince a trier of fact or the judge that it's a real thing that you are dealing with? This is not some speculative theory. Several things. It is important to lay the proper foundation. You need to ensure that you have adequate time at the trial to lay the proper foundation for expert testimony. One of the common mistakes that is made in trying a case of alienation in the court of law is that 
frequently you don't have enough time. Lawyers are expected to put on a case involving severe parental alienation in a space of two or three days. And you can't really do that. When you have a judge who is a skeptic or is simply not that well-versed in the area of alienation and estrangement of child alignment, you need to make sure you have proper time. You need adequate time to have the experts testify about the science of alienation. What is it? Why is it different from estrangement? How is it different from estrangement? What happens when proper intervention is not made? What are the short-term and long-term consequences of alienation? How do children behave when they are alienated? What are the signs of alienation? And why it's not appropriate to simply assume that these things will change on their own without appropriate intervention. The other, process, other thing to keep in mind is the process of voir dire. This is where you have an expert on the stand to talk about their background, their credentials, their qualifications. And sometimes lawyers skimp on this process. They fast track it or somehow they agree with the other side that this is an expert. We are gonna agree that so-and-so is an expert and we are not gonna spend time in going through that expert's background, credentials, qualifications, publications, and so forth. And that, in my opinion, is a mistake. Why? Because when you are trying to ask a judge, when you are trying to get the relief that you need, whether it's a specialized intervention program or a no contact order or a change of custody, you're asking a judge to take a significant step. And an expert's opinion is only as valuable as the credibility and the weight associated with it. So you need to give confidence to your judge. You need to empower the judge that he or she is doing the right thing by giving you the relief that you're asking for. And one way to do it is to make sure that you lay the proper foundation for your expert to talk about it. And the only way to do it is to give your expert enough time on the stand and have their qualifications, background, credentials, publications, all laid out for the court to learn about before you reach their final opinion. This is also important from an appellate standpoint. If you need to go to the appellate court to get the relief, if the trial decision is not in your favor and you need to get it reversed, it is important that you make an appropriate record at the trial level. And it's simply not possible to do that with inadequate voir dire or laying out the experts' credentials and qualifications. One of the other things that comes across when you're trying to convince a judge that it's a real thing is this smoke screen of alienation versus domestic violence or abuse. This is a commonly encountered piece of disinformation, and it's specifically designed to obfuscate the issues. It's deliberately placed argument to deceive the court in thinking that alienation is a false theory that is just drummed up to hide the real abusive behavior. And it's important to educate the court that this is not us versus them. This is not a binary question that the courts do not ignore the evidence of domestic violence by looking at alienation, that alienation and abuse are part of the same equation. There are two sides of the same point. And recognizing alienation does not take anything away from the concept of domestic violence. And there is a lot of misinformation out there. For example, some judges, or some lawyers believe that if allegations of abuse are made, there cannot be a case of allegation. Or if evidence of abuse is present, you can't have alienation in the case. And while that might be true in some situations, it's important to realize that the five-factor model that is typically used to prove a case of alienation itself has a factor three built into it 
that takes into account allegations and evidence of abuse. And evidence is the key, not just simply allegations here. If there are allegations, I'm sorry, if there, are, if there is evidence of abuse in a case, significant abuse, then you might want to take a step back and address that issue up front. But you need to be prepared to meet this argument when you're trying to convince your trial of fact that alienation is a real thing and the judges need to take, they need to be cognizant of this theory. Dr. Baker has written and published a lot about this and it's important to determine whether formal child abuse allegations concluded whether they were abused or not. And if not, the allegations of abuse simply cannot be used to control the theory of alienation. Another practice pointer, and this comes across uh, pretty often. And here's what happens. Lawyers at times are pretty quick to concede the argument of a hybrid case, that there are allegations of abuse made, the allegations of alienations, and some evaluation is done, or the judge sometimes makes a comment from the bench or in the chambers that looks like we have a hybrid case. Mom's alleging alienation, dad's alleging abuse, and we seem to have a hybrid case. It's a mistake to quickly concede the hybrid scenario because it's important not to equate causation with reaction. You need to separate whether the behaviors that caused the children to reject a parent occurred before these allegations of abu so-called abusive behavior or whether they're a part of it. And the targeted or rejected parents' reaction to those behaviors have to be separated from the causation. In other words, if a targeted parent is reacting suboptimally, or even inappropriately to alienation, those behaviors cannot be used as a part of alienation dynamic. That's separate. And that parent perhaps could need coaching. They could perhaps do a better job in managing their frustrations and their outrage as to how they are being rejected by their flesh and blood. But that does not make a case a hybrid case. It's a still, it's a still a case of alienation. So don't be quick to concede the hybrid argument. Because if you concede the hybrid argument, you are on your path to a completely different intervention. And it could do a lot of damage down the road if your case is of a severe or a moderate alienation. Let's go back to the slides. The second point, you need to convince a trial of fact after you talk about how alienation is real in your case, is that you have alienation in your particular case, that this is a case of parental alienation. How do you do that? There are several ways to do that. One way is to educate the court using the five-factor model of parental alienation. And a lot of other speakers are addressing this topic of five factors as well. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but I'm going to try to go through it quickly. The first factor you talk about is that the child is avoiding, resisting, or refusing the relationship with the parent. And when you are putting the case on, it is important to show to the court that this is a quantitative and a qualitative analysis. What do I mean by that? Often an argument is made that simply because the child is seeing the other parent, the child is going for the visitation, there is no alienation because they say, well, look, look, the child goes to see the mom or dad. There is a parenting time and place. In alienation cases, the child refuses to see the parents and this cannot be a case of alienation. And that's false. Because at the end of the day, we are talking about the relationship. If you have a situation where the child goes to see the parent, 
where the child grows in parenting time. However, the relationship is not the same as to what it was. The child has emotionally shut off from the parent. The child goes into his or her room and refuses to engage, doesn't come to the dinner table, refuses to talk to the parent, shuts up the door to the bedroom, and there is absolutely no interaction, no warmth, no emotional relationship that very well could be an alienated child. So it's a quantitative analysis and a qualitative analysis. Of course, if there are repeated violations of parenting time and the child is repeatedly refusing to go to the visitations, you could have an alienation case there. But even if those factors are not present, and if you have a case where the parenting time standards are met and the kid transitions back and forth, but the relationship is not what it used to be, and the child is emotionally shut off from the parent, that plays a role as well. And that needs to be explained to the court as to why that could be the case of alienation. Let's go to factor two. The presence of the prior positive relationship between the child and the now rejected parent. And this is where you have your client, the rejected or the targeted parent, talk about what the relationship was before the breakup or before the divorce or before the separation, before the problems started to arise. What was that relationship like? The parent who is now being rejected by the child, was that an involved parent? Was that parent coaching the sporting events, coach of a soccer team? Was that parent a part of the child's uh, life? Vacation pictures, birthday parties, parent-teacher conferences. The goal here is to show to the court that this parent who is now being rejected and portrayed as incompetent, abusive, insensitive, or whatever the excuse is, that not too long ago, there was a great normative relationship between the parent and the child. And that is an important factor for the court to understand so that they could compare the damage. They could compare the disparity between the two stages of the lives, the child and the parent and the normative relationship and the dysfunction that exists as of now. It's also important to dive deep into the factor too and to make sure that you lay out the evidence before the court because that helps the judge to determine the proportionality of the child's rejection of the parent. The key ingredient in parental alienation cases is that the child's reaction, the child's rejection to the parent is not proportionate to whatever the parent is said to have done. And frequently you see in these cases of the it complains about things that could be termed as frivolous. I don't want to see my mom because she is just mean to me. And when you dig deeper and you ask questions, the child is unable to come up with real reasons, with reasonable reasons. And that's where it is important for the just to understand what the relationship was like that now this parent who's being rejected and vilified, demonized. Not too long ago, a few weeks back, a few months back, there was a thriving relationship here. And what went wrong all of a sudden? What is it that this parent is alleged to have done that has turned this child away in such a significant manner? And that's why it's important to take the time and lay out the evidence before the court to explain the factor two. Factor three is the absence of abuse or neglect or seriously deficient parenting on the part of the now rejected parent. And this is important to, to show to the court that what you are talking about here, we are not talking about a perfect parent. We are not talking about a parent who has made no mistakes. You might have a situation where your client, the rejected parent, has made some questionable choices, may have engaged in some uh, behaviors, may have made some suboptimal parenting decisions, but that is not what factor three is about. 
Factor three is about significant evidence of abuse, physical abuse, emotional abuse, sexual abuse, severe alcoholism, severe neglect. A parent who was never a part of the child's life, who was absent for a significant portion of the child's life. I mean, those factors are present, they might need to be addressed. But factor three should not be confused with some questionable parenting decisions or some disciplinary actions that a parent may have taken on some sporadic occasions. That's not what this factor is about. So you need to make sure to distinguish factor three with some excuses that are brought against the parent that the child doesn't want to see the mom or dad because the mom or dad is disciplinarian, believes in rule house rules, or is too strict, doesn't let the child do them uh, video games or whatever excuses are made. That's not factor three. Let's go back to the next factor. Factor four. This is where you talk about the evidence of alienating behaviors. One of the common criticisms uh, against the theory of alienation is that it simply assumes that the child, by the child's rejection of a parent, there must have been something wrong here. That simply because the child is rejecting a parent, it's a case of alienation. And that's a straw man argument. No one says that the fact that the child is rejecting a parent in and of itself proves alienation. That's not true. The theory of alienation and the five factor model requires evidence of alienating behaviors on the part of the favored parent or the alienating parent. And these are behaviors that have been well studied in professional literature. There are research studies published about it. There are professional papers published on it. There are court decisions that have laid out this alienating behaviors which the courts have looked at with the courts have acknowledged as being harmful to the child in the relationship with the rejected parent. And you need to lay out these behaviors, or show the evidence of these behaviors before the judge. You don't need all of them. You don't need to show all 17 alienating strategies to make a case of alienation. You might have four or five or eight or 10. There is no magic formula here. Every case is different but you need to put together the evidence of these behaviors and then to present them before the judge. You could have various things. You could have emails, voicemails as evidence. You could have witnesses who have seen a parent, bad mouth of the parent in front of the child. You could have therapy records, child protective services, investigation reports, police reports, showing the bad behaviors but you need to put it all together in front of the court to talk about it. Finally, factor number five, the last factor, the signs of alienation present in the child. This is where you talk about why is this child an alienated child? What signs does this child show? What symptoms does the child show? that makes him or her different from a child who is, let's say, estranged. And alienated children demonstrate specific symptoms, specific signs, and you need to educate their court about this. You could have the child's therapist talk about this. You could have a counselor explain to the court about what the signs are. You could have a forensic expert on the stand who has reviewed carefully all the records in the case including therapy notes, medical records, uh, reports by uh, police or CPS, and show the court that these are the symptoms that are demonstrated by the children, which are consistent with the alienated children and the symptoms that they demonstrate. But you need to lay out this evidence for the court as well. Now, it's important to realize that this is not the only way to present the case of alienation. The five-factor model is one of the ways to present the case before the court. You can use uh, other theories. You can try to use some of the uh, 
strategies mentioned by other experts, such as Dr. Stanley Claver and Brian Rivlin in their book, uh, Children Held Hostage. They talk about the phenomenon of brainwashing and they talk about other strategies that the parents use. But at the end of the day, you are trying to put a case together that shows to the court that the parent who is being rejected is not being rejected because he or she is an incompetent or neglectful or an abusive parent. That the result that the child is rejecting that parent is because of undue influence, manipulation, coaching, brainwashing. And that needs to be explained through evidence of multi-factor model. And that's why you need significant amount of time to present this case. You just can't do it in a day or two because typically a case of severe alienation or even a moderate alienation case involves so many actors. There are usually allegations made, there are police interventions, there are child protective services investigations, there are school teacher uh, counseling records, there are children's uh, therapist records, and all of them need to be carefully analyzed, put together, and used in the court in a proper sequential way that tells a compelling story. Any jury trial is a way to tell your story. And while family court trials are not typically jury trials, you still have a trial of fact. And your jury is the judge in, who, in whose scale you are in. And that judge needs to be convinced that not only is the theory of alienation real, but it exists in this particular case and your children and you need appropriate intervention, which brings us to the next step here, that you desperately need proper intervention We have tremendous amount of research that shows that early intervention is key in parental alienation. Often the mistake made by many professionals is that they acknowledge the signs of alienation. They acknowledge that yes, one parent is behaving badly and there is evidence of alienation present, but it's not so bad. The children don't seem to be that affected. The children still go to with the other parent. The children do go on parenting time. They do engage with the parent who is being targeted, but there's some trouble brewing here. There are some complaints made by the children that are not based in reality. The children suddenly disengage. The alienating parent starts interfering in the relationship. There's nonstop texting or phone calls going back with the alienating parent and the child while the child is with the other parent. And these are signs of trouble and the need to be addressed early on. It is a mistake to let the case proceed to a level where the children are moderately or severely alienated because sometimes they may be just too late. So early intervention is the key and early intervention arises when you go to the court and ask for an evidentiary hearing to get the right relief. Many a times, significant amount of time is wasted because the professionals keep on negotiating. They talk about mediation, they talk about facilitation, there's therapy put in place. But unless those alienating behaviors are addressed and stop, things are not going to improve. So if you have signs of alienation, the sooner you ask the trial judge to intervene and to put proper safeguards in place, the better off you are. It's also important to recognize that the interventions that you're asking for are different in an abused children situation versus alienation. If you have a case where there are significant findings of abusive behavior, you need different treatment compared to an alienation situation. The treatment that you require in an alienation situation often consists of specialized programs. There are 
two well-known programs regarding the alienation, especially in case of severe alienation. One is turning points for families out of New York. Another is Family Bridges program. And there are other programs which, talk, which treat moderate to mild cases of alienation. But it would be a mistake to simply rush into the offices of a local therapist without first diagnosing the situation, without first having a finding made as to what's the cause of the dysfunction here. Why is the child rejecting the parent? Is it because the parent has done something significant? Is it because of a history, a documented history of abuse and neglect? Or is it because of the manipulation and coaching and brainwashing by the favorite parent? Because the former situation requires a completely different mental health intervention compared to the latter. And it's a mistake to just rush and put a solution together without first getting to the bottom of the dysfunction and why it arose in the first place. Which goes back to my earlier point that it's, you need to take the time to learn the case. You need to look at the evidence. You need to flesh out the evidence, put your cards on the table, look at it, and then try to convince the court to get you the right relief. If you don't spend this time at the front end and you rush into putting an ad hoc solution that doesn't fit the case and the factors present in the case, you are almost certain to be frustrated down the road. And you will have to go back to court and spend an enormous amount of time, effort, and money to undo the bad therapy, to undo the inappropriate or improper intervention, to undo what you have been doing for the past several months and to get the right relief. It's better to do it the right time, the right way the first time. So practice pointers. If you have a case of moderate to severe alienation, traditional psychotherapy will not work. Why? Because this is what typically happens. When you are sent, when your client is ordered to go to therapy, and if the therapy consists of traditional psychotherapy, the therapists are usually trained to validate the children's feelings, their emotions, instead of gently confronting them if they are not based in reality. So if your client is the rejected parent or the targeted parent, he or she will be going into this meetings sessions after the sessions, and the advice they will get is would be something vague as, well, you gotta show more empathy. You're going, you have to listen to the children. You have to acknowledge the hurt. You have to acknowledge the pain. You have to acknowledge the anguish that the children are facing and you are not allowed to argue with them. But what is sometimes missed is that these children do not have this complaint which are based out of reality. Often there is delusionary thinking. Often there is a case of borrowed scenarios. Often you have a case where the children are parroting the complaints made by the other parent, something that they did not even experience. And you see cases of children talking about what the other parent allegedly did years ago when they were two or three or four years old. And they did not witness the scenes. They did not experience those things, but they have heard about it again and again and again from the alienating parent, and they will talk about it. And the more you discuss those situations, the more you discuss those delusionary thinking without any critical thought, without any critical thinking of confronting the children's behaviors that are not based in reality, the worse it's going to get. And that's why traditional psychotherapy is absolutely worse than worthless in these cases. And you need to get to the bottom of the situation in order to get the right intervention. You also need to lay the proper foundation of expert testimony and scientific literature about the specialized program. What you're asking the judge to do sometimes may seem odd. It may seem outside the norm of what the 
judge is typically used to. If you're asking the judge to order change of temporary custody, to order the placement of the child and your client, the rejected parent or the targeted parent into a specialized program, let's say out of New York, together with the no contact period between the child and the alienating parent, that's a lot to ask for in some situations. If you are in a jurisdiction where the courts are not that sophisticated in terms of access to resources, having judicial assistance, access to mental health uh, service providers, you may be facing an uphill battle. And that's why it's important to make the court understand that what you are asking for is not some radical solution, is not some skeptical thing that may or may, or may not work. You're asking for something that has been tried and tested. You're asking for something that has been shown to work in numerous situations. You're asking for something that has been studied, that there are success outcome studies published about these programs. And that's why the court needs to understand that this is the only thing that has shown to work in cases of severe alienation. And you need to help the court understand what happens in this program. You need to take open the lid on this program and have the court understand what happens on day one. How does the therapist plan on interacting with the child and the rejected parent? What happens on day two? What happens on day three, day four? What is the, what is the methodology that is used? used in these programs? Has this been studied by independent experts? Are there other decisions from around the country that have placed the children and the parent in similar situations? You need to empower the judge that you are asking him or her to do the right thing here. And then you need to go further and ask for their limited temporary no contact order. And you need to also emphasize that this is not just to punish the alienator. It's not about punishing the alienating parent for the misdeeds or what he or she did or did not do. But mainly it is a part of the medical prescription, so to speak, that this no contact order is required for the child to break out of the loyalty contract. It is required so that the child experiences the parent who has been demonized and vilified and gets that experience in a real sense. It is absolutely necessary to undo all the brainwashing and programming that has taken place for months or years before the program comes into place. And then you need to wait and have a review hearing before resumption of the alienating parent back into the family. And the courts need to look at it. One, one way to do this would be to help the court see the dynamic here. If you think about it, let's say you have a case where one parent has been found to be severely alcoholic or a drug abuser. No judge will have a problem in ordering that parents to a rehab facility or to order them to do randomized drug testing to ensure that he or she is not dangerous to be around with the child. And before they allow their parent full unsupervised parenting time, they will put many restrictions to safeguard the child's emotional and physical well-being. A case of severe alienation is no different. In a case of severe alienation, you have a situation where the child has been subjected to emotional and psychological abuse. And you, what you do is to first safeguard the child. The primary objective is to protect the child. The primary objective in these cases is not parenting time. It's not custody. So it would be a mistake to go to the court and say, well, this is about we want to make up parenting time, we want custody, the parenting time has been violated. That all may be well and true, but that's secondary. The primary goal is that this is about child protection 101. 
We want this kid to be protected. And we want to put the safeguards around the child. Let the alienating parent demonstrate that he or she has learned the lesson. And now they understand that the behaviors that they engaged in, how damaging they were to the child, how damaging they were to the child's relationship with the other parent, how it caused the rift between the child and the targeted parent. And they need to go to work with their counselor and the therapist to learn about those behaviors. And then the court should take a step back and have a review hearing before resumption of parenting time for the alienating parent. If there are signs of regression, if there are signs of trouble brewing again, if the child continues to regress or slide back, the court should step in and perhaps extend the no contact period again. This is not a one-time solution. You have to watch for these pathological behaviors so that they don't resume and you have to allow the child a margin of safety, which can only be got by specialized programs, no contact order, and aftercare professionals who continue to work with the targeted parent and the child after their end of the four day program, which is a specialized program. Let's go back to slides. Some issues uh, that typically come up in litigation of uh, alienation cases. In my opinion, one of the single most important thing that comes across or that comes up in doing these cases in the court and trying these cases before a judge, a trial of fact, is the issue of credibility. When you are complaining about alienation, when you are trying to get the relief that you want from your trial of fact, you have to be credible. You have to be likable. You have to be believable. The judge has to look at you and trust your narrative before he or she is going to give you the relief that you ask for. Sometimes what happens is that frustrated parents go on social media and vent their frustrations. They talk about judges, the bad mouth judges, the bad mouth guardians and litem, the bad mouth experts, they disclose the court filings, they publish whatever was filed in the court, they ask for suggestions, everyone jumps on the bandwagon and starts talking about uh, what should happen in the case. And this is all in the public domain. This could really hurt you in the court. Imagine yourself on the stand and being confronted with the evidence of what you have put out on this Facebook or social media, complaining about your case or sharing documents, bad-mouthing a lot of professionals. Even if you had legitimate reasons to do so, doing such things could really, really hurt your case. I have seen many cases where a frustrated parent is not examined with this evidence. Their posts of things that happened in the case early on, they're, talk, they're talking about frustration, how the therapist completely screwed the situation up, how so and so judge did not quite get it, how the system is absolutely corrupt, and that could really hurt your credibility. So be very careful when you share your details about the case on social media. It would be helpful to get a parenting coach as you are going through these cases because they're incredibly painful. Going through a case of alienation is traumatic for a targeted parent. It is painful to be rejected by your flesh and blood. It is extremely distressing to complain about lack of parenting time how your court orders are repeatedly violated by the other side without any consequences, how your lawyer or the therapist or counselor just doesn't seem to get it, what's going on. But 
venting those frustrations on social media is not the way to go. It could definitely hurt you. It could harm your case. And you need to think about it in a different way. I have a couple of slides here, the cases that uh, we can look up or you can look up down the road. Two cases out of Nebraska, where the court changed custody, modified custody, and the parent appealed. And even though there were significant issues of alienation involved, the decision did not quite come out as it should have been because of credibility. That because the complaining parent did not show proper credibility, was not believable. There were loopholes in the testimony. There were issues where the credibility was shaken. The intervention did not come out as it should have. Credibility is the king. It matters a lot, not just for you, for experts as well, for lawyers as well. Let's uh, talk a little bit about uh, common myths and fallacies that come across in these cases when you're talking about alienation situation. So one of the common myth is that parental alienation is simply a tool that is used by abusing men against women. And there are court decisions where the courts have rejected such simplistic gender uh, argument that it's not just women who alienate their children, but not just men who alienate the children. Both genders have been found to have engaged in alienating behaviors. And it's important to confront this misinformation head on. And it's important that your lawyer and you have the right research at your fingertips. One of the important papers, peer reviewed papers that came out recently was published in the journal published by American Psychological Association. And this article published by Dr. Jennifer Harmon and Dr. Demosthenes Mirandos debunked this theory that alienation or the theory of alienation is misused in courts to protect abusive men. The argument was made that the abusive men simply go to court and yell parental alienation to hide their abusive behaviors. And no sooner than the judge hears the term parental alienation, they change custody and abusive actions are not taken into account and men are just, men just basically get, get out of the jail card free. And that's not true. The study showed that when you study these cases from the courts around the country, the courts have intervened, the courts have changed custody, the courts have put sanction into place when they have found evidence of alienation, not just allegations. When the court finds evidence after holding a trial, after holding an evidentiary hearing, then and only then they have intervened and changed custody. It's a mistake to believe or to say that the court simply go and change custody and give the kid to the so-called rejected parent simply because other parent is claiming alienation. That doesn't happen. No judge does that. In fact, it's an uphill battle in most cases to put on a case of alienation and to convince the judge to do the right thing and make a finding, a judicial finding of alienation. Another paper by Dr. Harmon, which has uh, talked about how parental alienation is a form of family violence and has serious consequences for the children and families. And that's important because many judges are well-trained in recognizing signs of domestic violence. They go through the programs, they attend the continuing legal education, they are familiar with the power and control wheel and all of the professional literature that goes with domestic violence and abusive behaviors. 
And this paper written by Dr. Harmon studied those behaviors and drew connections with alienating behaviors. At the end of the day, alienation too is abuse. Alienating behaviors are also about power and control. And being subjected to alienation also calls children the same, if not greater level of harm that they are subjected to when there are domestic violence present in the case. So again, you need to go beyond just the label. You need to study the scientific literature and more importantly, have it broken down before the trial of fact to get the intervention that you need. So let's uh, recap a little bit. The question whether American family courts acknowledge parental alienation, the answer to that question is a resounding yes. Family courts have acknowledged parental alienation. In most situations, they have used that very term, but in many situations, in many cases, they've used other terms to describe alienating behaviors. But that brings me to another important point. Some professionals believe that it would be advantageous not to use the term parental alienation. But you are better off not using the term in the court simply because of controversy associated with it or not to get into a long drawn argument. Let's just not use that term. And let's just talk about parental interference, for example. I believe it would be a mistake to do so if you indeed have a case of alienation. I think if you do have a case of parental alienation, you absolutely should use the term to describe the phenomenon to the court. There is no dearth of professional and legal literature supporting parental alienation as a theory. There is a tremendous amount of case law available where the courts have acknowledged it and courts have intervened. There is a tremendous amount of scientific literature available that has studied the phenomenon of parental alienation. So to shy away from using the term would be a mistake. I would say absolutely meet that term head on and use it in the court if you have evidence supporting your argument. By the same token, because we see more and more courts using this term and intervening, it's also being used in cases where it's not present. We frequently see motions filed by parents or lawyers alleging or claiming parental alienation where there's no evidence supporting that. All bad behavior doesn't translate into parental alienation. A child who refuses to go on a parenting time or is oppositional or defiant or is challenging parental authority doesn't mean that the child must be alienated. So be careful when you use that term. Before you use the term in a court of law, you need to absolutely be sure that you have evidence supporting the use of the term. Because you cannot be in a worse situation when you use that term and the court finds that there is no evidence of alienation. You have lost your credibility there. And you need to be careful about not being, not rushing into the court prematurely without getting the evidence all squared away and looked at by a professional, by an expert and putting it together for the court's review. The other issue to think about in this case is, is that Frequently, lawyers and targeted parents shy away from trials or evidentiary hearings. The conventional wisdom is that a trial is not going to be helpful, that it is not going to be in your children's best interest to go through a contentious trial. It's going to be uh, very expensive, it's going to be time consuming, and let's all meet together and try to address it and put a solution in place. And that's all well and good. And there are understandably concerns about expenditure of time, effort, and money. But if it's truly a case of alienation, 
then you probably are dealing with an alienator who probably has undiagnosed personality disorders. There are pathogenic behaviors at issue here. And you simply can't expect someone like that to come to the mediation table or a negotiation table in good faith. And time is the key. The window of opportunity that you have to get the appropriate intervention from the court is very narrow in many occasions. If you have a child who is 12 or 13 or 14 years of age, that window for intervention is fast closing for you. Many judges subscribe to this theory that if a child or a teenager, if it's 15 or 16, it's too late to do anything about it. That you can't really make teenagers follow the court orders and you can't force them into a program they don't want to go. And that's a mistake, first of all. We do have professional literature peer reviewed that demonstrates that adolescents, teenagers, even 17 and above, when they are met with authority, when they are told about the court orders in place, when they are put in a specialized program with no contact order in place, they do come back. They do thrive in those programs. Children are resilient, and there are several success studies outcomes published and studied where these children have rebonded with the parents. So it's not true that if a kid is 15 or 16 or even 17, it's simply too late to do anything about it. By the same token, if you are in the situation, then time is the number one issue here. Time is the enemy, as they say in alienation cases. And the sooner you get to the right intervention, the better for you. So you may decide not to spend too much time in negotiating or a therapy outcome that is not going to be helpful. When you have all this professional literature that shows how traditional psychotherapy or programs similar to traditional psychotherapy are not going to be helpful in that situation, why would you agree to it? If it's only because to avoid a trial and expense of effort and money, you are only fooling yourself because you might be in the same situation six months down the road. And at that point in time, the child has grown. You've been doing something that hasn't worked in the past six months. It is easy for other people to share past the blame on. It's better to address that issue up front with the code and get the right kind of relief that you need in these cases. This is not rocket science. Alienation cases are difficult, yes, but it is not impossible to win these cases. There are several decisions around the country and from Canada as well, where trial judges have found alienation without an expert. Without expert testimony, the trial judges have found alienating behaviors and signs of alienation in the children. What you need to demonstrate is that the evidence that you have about alienating behaviors together with the signs of alienation, looking at the past relationship and what it was, and put it all together in a package before the court and ask the judge to rule in the best interest of the child. Judges are used to decide issues on custody and parenting time evaluating the best interest factors in many jurisdictions. The same judge, when he's confronted with the evidence of alienation, should not have a problem in looking at the evidence, looking at the behaviors that are being complained about, looking at the signs of alienation present in the children, and then trying to figure out what's the right thing to do here. And in severe cases, the right thing to do would be to order a temporary change of custody to place the child with the rejected and the targeted pen into a specialized program together with a temporary no contact period. 
and it has shown to work. It has been studied, and that's what you should be going for. The key to get there is to lay a proper foundation. And you do that by doing three things. One, persuading the court that the parental alienation theory is real, scientific, and is supported by empirical research. Two, it exists in your case, and you have evidence of alienation, not merely speculations, not merely allegations, but hard, concrete evidence. And three, your children need proper intervention. And you need to go in with the suggested programs, what you're asking for, that these are the programs you want for your child. Why do they work? Why are they appropriate fit in the case? Why the other programs such as traditional psychotherapy have not worked in the past, will never work? And then first with the judge to do the right thing. And one of the fundamental thing to remember is when you are doing this, you need adequate time to prepare. These cases are extremely fact intensive. They are data intensive, they are science intensive, and they take time to prepare. You need to get ready with the charts showing the behaviors. You need to get ready with the evidentiary charts showing the signs of alienation. You need to have your expert on the stand to educate the court about the signs, about the facts, some of the pathological behaviors present in your case, and to explain what is the consequence of inaction. A lot of time there's fear mongering, and a lot of times the other side rushes into the court and tries to talk about these doomsday scenarios. Oh, judge, if you order this specialized program, the child's gonna run away, the child's gonna hurt himself or herself, and we are gonna have a major. Uh, tragedy on our hands and emergencies and whatnot. We don't have any studies that have shown that these children do that. There's no, there's no study out there, there are no cases out there where a court where a, which has ordered children to be placed into the specialist programs for alienation or where the courts have removed the children from alienating parents, the children have done this dramatic or drastic things. On the contrary, we have studies that show that these programs do work. But those doomsday scenarios that are often put before the courts end up in making the judges afraid. They end up making the judge second guess himself or herself into providing this intervention. And that is where you need to go the extra mile. That is where you, after you present the evidence of alienation and what happens in this case and why you need a program, you need to go further and explain to the judge that he or she is not alone in ordering this intervention. That there are courts around the country which have done something similar. And you need to think outside the box. I'm often told that in a, in a particular jurisdiction, we don't have a, President, a judicial president, where a judge has done something similar. Let's say you are in uh, South Dakota and your lawyer tells you that, well, our judges don't do this. I don't see this judge pulling the child away from the alienating parent and putting the kid in a specialized program and flying off to New York or California or whatever. That might be true. You may not have that judicial precedent in place. You might not have those cases in your jurisdiction, but there are plenty of cases from around the country. And I'm not shy about using them. What I try to do is to convince the judge, the finder of the fact and the, tri uh, the trial of the fact, that while we may not have an exact case about this situation from the Court of Appeals and the Supreme Court of the state, Look at this collection of cases from the courts around the country. Look at these judges from Michigan, from New York, from California, Florida, Hawaii, Washington, which have been in similar situations, which have wrestled with the problems that you are wrestling with 
in your case, in this case. And let's look at the solutions they've come up with. Those cases may not be binding on your trial judge, but they empower the judge. They provide the empowerment, they provide credibility, they provide support. And it's important to do that so that your trial judge is not afraid that he or she is being asked to do something that is radical, that is unheard of, that has never been done before. And that's where you need to go with those cases in hand, with the scientific literature in hand, and the right kind of expert who can break it all down into smaller chunks of fact and science to get you the relief that you want. To go back to the family violence, um, I think it's important to talk about how alienation is just a form of family violence. It's no different than uh, abuse, or domestic abuse, physical abuse, emotional abuse. It's just a different form of it. And at the end of this slides, you will find some references which I have put together, which are often used in cases involving alienation. Uh, and uh, here's my contact information at the very end of the slide. So, briefly recap what we have talked about. Alienation is a real phenomenon. It has been accepted by American courts. The courts understand it. The courts have intervened. There are specialized programs that the courts have looked to to remedy alienation. You can prove alienation in the court of law using the five-factor model. You can prove it by other ways as well. Uh, having a good expert to break down the science and the facts and the connect the dots for the judge is absolutely helpful. But in some instances, you may not need that. But no matter how you look at it, do not accept this piece of misinformation that parental alienation somehow doesn't exist or is not accepted by American courts. And it would be just futile to mention that term and to shy away from it. Nothing could be further from truth. It is real. Courts do accept it. Courts have acknowledged it. And you need your opportunity in the court to present the evidence, present the case before the court. Where cases are lost, where time is often lost, is when parents and the lawyers go to the courts and there are motions after motions filed and there are arguments made and there are negotiations that take place and valuable time is often wasted. It's critical to get the trial. It is critical for you to get an evidentiary hearing from the court where you can present the evidence, not just argument, not just allegations, but actual evidence before the court, because that's what the court needs to make a finding, a judicial finding of parental alienation, because that finding is needed. In fact, it's a requirement that you need before you get the right and the proper kind of intervention. And once you have that finding, you can take the next step and discuss what are the interventions, where do we go from here? I hope this was helpful to you. And I will be around talking about uh, uh, at the break, break room sessions, breakout sessions, and the Q&A round. And look forward to speaking and interacting with you. Thank you.